Oh, the town of Perryton, Texas is, has fewer than 8,000 people in it. So it's a small town, but this last week, a tornado tore through that town. And there are people who were in Perryton, Texas, who did not know that a tornado had gone through their town. That is how fast it came and how designated and small that alley of destruction was. Now, it hit Main Street, but if you weren't on Main Street, you may not have known. I've talked to folks that I know of who have loved ones there. That's what they said. There are people who didn't know. The tornado hit also a mobile home park where outside an 11-year-old boy was playing. That 11-year-old boy didn't make it. He died. He was one of those who were killed in that tornado. And I don't know what to do with that, really. What do you do with that? This morning, I want us to look at how do we live life in the face of trauma and tragedy and tests and trials, and there's one that's out there named Satan that's working against us. Trials and tests and trials, Satan's my sermon this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Only one more week after this week in this passage here, folks. Next week, we'll look at everyday grace that we can have, but today we're looking at Paul's thorn in the flesh. So let's stand at the reading of God's word this morning. Again, I want to read the entire passage to give us the context of what Paul is writing about, but we're going to focus upon the thorn in the flesh that he had. Paul writes, I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I say or do or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I will delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You may be seated. Let me show how I want to walk through this sermon this morning, and, and each of the points will come up so that if you want to take the notes, you can fill them in. But we're going to begin this morning with the fact that everyone gets thorns in the flesh. And then after that, we're going to follow up with the fact that life is fragile, all right? Life is very fragile. Then we're going to see after that, we want our lives to mean something. We want life to mean something. And then after that, what's with Satan? What's Satan got to do with anything, right? And then Satan's in the spiritual realm as well, so we need to engage that spiritual realm. Prayer engages the spiritual realm, and then we'll see our conclusion that grace brings hope. So let's look at everyone gets thorns in the flesh. Just ask the Apostle Paul, his thorn in the flesh. This has been a pastime for religious scholars. There's a whole industry who seems to have been writing about the Apostle Paul and his thorn in the flesh and what it was. And so that many believe that, you know what, Paul, it seems to be a physical ailment. And they will write about how they believe that Paul had this issue or that issue, and they will identify that malady. Never mind the fact that when you and I go to the doctor and they sit there and they try to diagnose what you have, right? They go, well, we'll give you an antibiotic and just see if that helps, all right? The human body is so complex that modern day doctors, they have to have through their knowledge and experience, and even then they can get the diagnosis, well, they can be off a little bit. But biblical scholars, when they look back, not just centuries, but through two millennia, they can diagnose exactly what was wrong with the Apostle Paul, right? It's a miracle. Next time you're sick, 
call up a religious scholar and they will tell you what's wrong with you. All right, that's it. Now, we don't know what was wrong with the Apostle Paul. He doesn't say it. We don't know it today, folks. I'm going to give you a secret. We're never going to know. We don't know. I always talk about in 150 years, oh, we'll know then. No, you know, in 150 years, we won't care what Paul's thorn in the flesh was, all right? I imagine he doesn't even care right now what it was. He's looking at the face of Jesus and celebrating that. So Paul's thorn in the flesh, you know what? I'm glad we don't know, and here's the reason why. Because whatever thorn in the flesh you get, maybe that's what Paul had. Maybe it was a physical ailment. Maybe, maybe it was a spiritual condition. Maybe a spiritual issue. Maybe Paul wrestled with a specific temptation to sin. Some of us can have that. Maybe it was social. Maybe it was all of those opponents against Paul. Or those folks out in our society still that trying to undermine the way you live the Christian life at work, at school, in the community. That means that we can come to this passage and we can find somebody who's a kindred spirit that's, yes, Paul understands. He gets it. I have a thorn in the flesh and he understood exactly what I am going through right now. Paul had a problem. It was a significant problem. He prayed three times for the Lord to take it away from him. But God did not take it away from him. God left it there. And said, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul, I don't want to take your thorn away. I want to leave it there. And I want to work with you and walk with you through this life and through this thorn. That's what I want to do. Folks, that's what God usually chooses to do, isn't it? He usually chooses to work with us through life's tests and traumas and tragedies. Instead of taking us around them or over them or under them. He wants to go through those times with us. So what's going on? I think we know that life is fragile, my second point. Life is fragile. Thorns in life teach us how fragile life is. Wives, moms, sick husbands teach you how fragile life is, right? Because we husbands, oh my goodness, we get a hangnail and we're in bed for a week, aren't we? I mean, oh, it hurts so bad. You don't understand. Oh, yeah. I know, guys, I'm letting, uh, I'm letting information that's privileged out. I'm not supposed to talk about that. Folks, God has created us in this life that is fragile. And God has decided to leave us in this life that is so fragile. He has not put a barrier necessarily around us that says, okay, you're not gonna be fragile anymore. I think this is one reason why life is so precious. Where's your valuable knickknacks at in your home? Don't you put them up on a shelf, show them off, dust them every once in a while. They're important and they're precious to you. They're fragile. Where's the frying pan? Oh, you'll, you'll dump it in the cabinet, right? I know. Some of you are asking, what's a frying pan? Okay, because you don't cook anymore. Yeah. All right, well, we used to have skillets that were made of metal, and we cooked on these, okay, and put them on the stove. It can heat it up. You just throw them anywhere, right? And you know what? If it gets scratched, ah, so what? I can, you know, and it's hard to scratch some of them, right? You know, they can still, you know, they're still nonstick. I've seen those commercials, Yeah. It's the fragility that makes some of our most precious objects valuable to us. And a skillet, well, that's just one level above a brick, isn't it? Just about. Life is precious. But in this world where horrible suffering takes place, we begin to feel, we really begin to think that God is absent. That God is not with us. Where was God with that 11-year-old boy in Perryton, Texas? And so some people begin to talk about God is not there. And we know that's not true. We know that that's not reality. That's not what Scripture teaches us. And in fact, that challenges us to misbelieve the most precious blessing I believe we have, and that is God with us. The presence of God, Isaiah 7, 14. We talk about it every Christmas, right? The Emmanuel passage. What does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. What did David say? Psalm 51, please, Lord, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. God, I want you to be with me. I want you with us. 
Don't take that away. It is a precious blessing that God gives to us. And we don't always feel it. We don't always experience it, but it doesn't take away the fact that God is always with each and every one of us. God is with you. And do not let the circumstances dictate to you what God thinks about you. Remember last week we talked about finding God's will. One of the ways was through the Holy Spirit, through circumstance. That's just one of the four ways that need to line up. Don't let circumstance alone tell you about what to believe. God has good reason we have to believe to allow evil to exist. God must have good reason to allow evil to exist, for traumas to hit our lives and for tragedies to devastate the lives of our loved ones, family, friends. That's what we do. We have faith in God and we trust in his actions. Because this really isn't an argument about God's absence. Some people will use it as an argument that God does not exist and it's a miserable argument logically. All right, that's a, it's an emotional law argument is what it is. It's not a logical argument. God exists. Now, we may question whether or not God is good or not. That's another conversation. That's a conversation for those who believe in God, for theists, all right? And we're going to be able to testify of God's goodness in the midst of tragedy and trauma and problems. Folks, we trust people. Who do we trust? Do you trust your next door neighbor? Do you trust your spouse? Do you trust the person at the checkout stand? Do you trust the server at the restaurant? Well, you trust the server somewhat, right? They're, they're in control of your food, right? Yeah. Do you trust a stranger going down the highway? We give more trust to those we know, don't we? And we don't trust acquaintances as much. And we have been taught since children not to trust strangers, right? Until you get to know them and they become good friends, then we can trust them. Folks, your relationship with God ties in right here. If you don't know God, if he is a stranger to you, then naturally you're going to doubt his goodness. You're going to doubt what he is doing. And you're going to believe, you know what? I don't even think God exists anymore. But he does. Even if you have God as an acquaintance, you meet with him on an off Sunday every once in a while. I know, not y'all. All those other folks at other churches that come hit and miss, all right? No, not y'all. If God's only an acquaintance, you won't have full trust in him. And so that, yes, when tragedy, when trauma, when tests hit you, it's going to be a difficult time for you in a serious test. Folks, we walk with the Lord and we trust that what God is doing, he has a purpose for that and knows what he is doing. We also believe that God, now, get, now, now hear all of what I'm going to say. Either hear all of what I'm going to say or go to sleep right now. All right, I don't hear none of it, either all of it or none of it, all right? We talk about God can do anything, but I'm going to ask a simple question. Can God build a rock? Can he make a rock so heavy he can't lift it? And the answer is no, he can't. Because God cannot do anything that is illogical in reality. And that is illogical for God to make a rock so big he can't, he can't lift it. So we automatically begin to think, you know what? Why couldn't God have made a world of free will where we can make choices and yet there's no evil and there's no downside. And there's no bad things that happen to us. You see, God, I'm going to trust, can't make a rock too heavy, so heavy he can't lift it. And so what my mind can think is not necessarily a real world. It's not real. It's imaginary. It's illogical to think of that way. I trust the God that we have, that he has created this life the way it is, fragile as life is, He's created it wonderfully and beautiful because those fragile things mean something to us. They're precious to us, much more than the frying pans. And God has created this life this way. And so we trust God. 
We trust God's reason for this world. And for, for those of us who believe in free will and that free will works today, that God allows us to make bad decisions that hurt ourselves and hurt others, and others have free will to hurt ourselves and our loved ones. And for those of us who believe in predestination, you know what? We believe that God is working all things for his ultimate glory, and this is the world that's going to bring him that most glory. And that's what we choose to believe. And so naturally, we believe that our lives, my third point, we want our lives to mean something. We want our lives to have significance. Why are there so many TikTok videos? And why is there so many Instagrams and Snapchats and Facebook pictures? I want my life to mean something. It means something. Look what I had for lunch right here. Look at this picture. All right. My life means something. All right. And when we go through trauma and tragedies, we really want them to mean something. God, this hurts. It has to be for something good. It has to be for something more than just everyday life. I want it to mean more than that. And I'll give you some hard facts here. The purpose for our lives is not to be happy despite what our society and culture teaches. Be happy. And if you can't be happy, then ignore the unhappiness or we'll throw some pills at you and that'll help you just to forget everything then. Because you're supposed to be happy. Now, God didn't create us to be unhappy, okay? That's not, I'm not saying that. Don't get me wrong here. God, does, God didn't create us to, for happiness. He didn't create us for unhappiness. It's like, oh man, this life is horrible. Why'd you create me, God? That's not what he did. God created us so that we would know him, that we would be in relationship with him, and that we could glorify him. And in that, we are going to find joy. There will be happy times. There will be sad times. But there can still be joy deep down inside of us, trusting our great God, but it doesn't mean I'm going to go around smiling all the time because I'm happy, and I'm not going to go around all the time smiling, pretending to be happy because I'm not happy all the time, and no, you don't have a right to go ask my wife about my unhappy times, all right? No, because <laughs> that's whenever I, sometimes I have to confess, Lord, all right, I, wasn't unha I was unhappy, and I wasn't unhappy the right way. Second thing we need to understand is that humanity is in rebellion against God. If you don't think so, watch last night's news. I didn't watch last night's news, but I can trust that last night's news wasn't all good. We see rebellion against God all over this planet. And we think that, oh, despite the fact that we're in rebellion against God, we're going to have a happy and everything's going to go wonderful life. No, that's not going to happen at all. If for the most part we're in rebellion against God, there is going to be negative consequences from that rebellion, that sin, if you will. And then we're going to also understand that God's purpose for our lives today doesn't end with this life that we live now, that it's going to go for all eternity, isn't it? For eternal life. That this life now, the difficulties I face, you know, I understand I don't get to bring all the money I might save up, but you know what? I don't get to bring all the evil in my life I've brought with me too. Evil stays back and I'm going to go into the glory. It's called glory land for a reason. It's because it's, it's glorious. And that's what we look forward to. Paul, you have a thorn in the flesh to keep you humble so that you don't get bigger than you think you really are. Paul understood why he had a thorn in the flesh. My dog, Penny, who was 15 years old, you may have heard me say she was 16. I took her to the vet this week and asked, and he told me she was 15, so she's probably going to need some counseling because I've been telling, telling the lady in the house, you're older than you, you look older than you really are, all right? So I took Penny to the vet this week, and the vet had two syringes, needles, inoculations, two vaccines. I held my little, my ferocious Pomeranian Pomeranian's a brown puffball is what a Pomeranian is, y'all, all right? I held her close to me. It's going to be all right, Penny. 
And she looked up at me and said, why, what's happening? No, she didn't say anything, did she? She's a dog, right? <laughs> she just sat there like, what's going on? And then the sound that emitted from her, I didn't think a dog that small could emit whenever that first shot went into her. And just to prove that that wasn't a fluke, whenever she got the second shot, she emitted the same sound again. Oh my gosh. It was like somebody was trying to cut off all of her legs at once. To make matters worse the next day, I was petting her and I happened to hit that spot. Full 24 hours later, I barely touched it. Oh boy, here's that noise again. <laughs> go outside, dog, it's time to go outside. Now, I did not, whenever I touched on Friday, whenever I touched her at that spot, I didn't sit her down and say, all right, Penny, I understand, it hurt, okay? But you know what? That was an inoculation. It was a vaccine to prevent you from getting diseases that can really cause harm. Penny didn't look at me and say, oh, I understand the pain now. No, she's a dog. I didn't talk to my dog like that. She doesn't understand. And so when I come to God, God is so vastly beyond me that I can understand such a small part of him that what he would probably need to communicate to me is in ways that I wouldn't even understand his communication. But I take faith to know that there is redemption in the pain that I experience, that God's gonna bring about the good, that God has brought me this far in this life and has brought you this far in this life to this moment, to this place right now, safely. And I mean that by you being here and you're breathing, okay? Now, all of us have ailments. Some of us are very, have, have some more tragic situations, but we're here and God has brought us safely here and we've gone through some tough times but we are here and God has brought us here. And those tough times are what make part of who we are today. And God is working in our lives today so that we can serve him because of those past experiences. I have had negative and very tragic things happen in my life and Kathy has, and we can minister to folks differently because of those things. God has redeemed them and we can touch them. And the same's happened in your life. You've had tragedies happen to you that now you can touch people's lives in a way that you could not had those tragedies not befallen you. And then we look to the future and we look to the future with the past as giving us guidance, all right? giving us wisdom so that we can share that wisdom and share that guidance under the Holy Spirit with others. Well, what's with Satan? And I know I don't have a whole lot of time, but he doesn't deserve a lot of time, does he? All right. I believe in Satan. I believe that Satan is, yes. He, I believe that uh, he is what Paul is saying. Hey, you're thorn from Satan. He's not going to say that God's bringing horrible things into my life. God says, you know, Satan can do that. Satan, I believe, is a fallen angel, although I think the Bible doesn't teach it directly. It hints at that, and that's why I believe. I believe in the demons, probably fallen angels also, and that they are at work against God and against us, and that Satan is not divine in himself. He doesn't have the power of God. Satan is not human. He's not made in the image of God, the way that you and I are made in the image of God. And I also believe that this, that if Satan is out to destroy us, absolutely, God restrains him. And that's why we're not destroyed, absolutely. So that's what's with Satan. And sometimes even I think what Satan does backfires on him. And I think it did with Job. Job, the most righteous man in the East, loses his wealth, loses his family, loses his health. His wife even says, why don't you just curse God and die? Be done with everything. His friends come and they stay for a week and don't say a word. And then they start talking and then his friends become adversaries. And in the end, what do we find out about Job? Job, you've seen God. You've seen God in his greatness and his goodness and in his mystery and in his power. Will you still worship. I think that's what Job's about. It's learning to live with God. Can you live with a God that allows this to happen to your life? Can you learn to live with a God that you don't fully understand? And I think that Job says, yes, when Satan attacked their relationship, look at Job, God. Oh, you just have your hand around him, protect him, take it away, and he will turn away from you. But Job chose not to do that. Job chose to embrace God. 
So Satan is not the one we need to fear because he is limited and we trust in what God does. Prayer engages the spiritual realm. Folks, you want to you do something that's significant and powerful? It's prayer. Because, yes, I believe in the spiritual realm. Ever since the Enlightenment, we've been trying to jettison spiritual realm. If you can't see it, taste it, smell it, measure it, and everything else, it can't be real. But yet, as long as these hundreds of years since the Enlightenment, we've been trying to jettison the spiritual realm, the majority of people in our country, even the world, believe that there's something more than the physical physical realm, they believe in the spiritual realm. Even those who've left Christianity still believe that there is a spiritual realm. And I say, you know what? You're right. And the way that you and I engage in that is through prayer. We talk to God who sees all. The one that works in all to bring glory to his name and to help purify and benefit us in our lives as well. So engage in prayer. Paul did. Paul got, to, Paul got told no, didn't he? God's good, though. God just didn't say, you know, Paul didn't say, look, get rid of this thorn in the flesh. God didn't say no. God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Isn't that a nice way of saying no? Parents, try that with your kids, you know. Mommy, can I have? My grace is sufficient for you. All right, yeah. <laughs> Paul got told no. We don't always get what we ask for. But keep talking to God. Keep hanging out with him. Because prayer isn't about getting things from God. It's about relating to him. And we come to the point where grace brings hope. My grace is sufficient for you. Folks, choose to believe it's a choice. In difficult times, believe. Don't stop believing. But believe. That's perseverance. Perseverance isn't for good times. Everybody believes in good times. But it's in the bad times that we persevere. And sometimes faith in God is all that we have to hang on to. And the reason why I can say that there is hope, there's hope for the future is because, again, I know my past. The past is found ultimately on a hill called Calvary where evil was defeated. It wasn't obliterated. That's why we still see it. But it was defeated. It was given a death blow. And it is not going to succeed. And it is not going to go on for eternity. We believe. We believe in a great God who defeated evil and give us, has given us victory in Jesus Christ. <sighs> Folks, we have a problem. I'll put it on me, and I'll just see if you have the same problem. I don't need Satan to be disobedient to God. I am an expert at sinning, all right? Again, you don't get to ask my wife about that, okay? That's, that's insider information. I'm an expert at sinning, and I don't need Satan to lead me into sin. Now, he does at times, but it's my fault, not his. I have a sneaky suspicion about you too, by the way, okay? But I won't, I won't necessarily point my finger at you that hard this morning. I think you're pretty good experts at sin more than likely, all right? Even if you do look good on the outside and act really good at times. And sin in our lives is a problem. Because sin, we're not going to have sin in heaven. Otherwise, it's not going to be heaven, is it, right? I mean, if heaven has sin, what, what's heavenly about it? I need my sin problem taken care of, and it needs to be taken care of now. I need that sin to be washed away, as the Bible says, Isaiah 1. Today's the day that your sin can be washed away. It doesn't mean you're going to have a problem-free life. No, you'll still have problems. But you're going to walk with the one who has the power and the ability to get you through each and every situation and trauma and crises and test. His name is Jesus, and if he has to, he'll carry you, but he'll get you through. 
In just a moment, we're going to stand and pray. Your staff will be up here at the front. If you're ready to receive that life, to receive Christ as your Savior, we will be here. If you want to come and join this church, when we stand together and when we face, as individuals and as individual families face tough times, we come together to help one another. Be a part of this church. We invite you to come and join our church. If you need special prayer, we make ourselves available to you this day. What's your decision? Let's stand for our word of prayer right now. Lord God, this day as we hear again from the Apostle Paul in this passage, as we hear about that thorn in the flesh, and every one of us knows exactly what he means. Even though we don't know what his thorn was, we have all experienced thorns in our lives. God, thank you for understanding. And right now, Lord, grant us your grace that leads to hope. Hope that evil is not ultimate, but is finite and will end. Lord, bring that hope to us, most of all the hope that we all need for you, Lord Jesus, to be our Savior. Lord, we give you our faith, our allegiance. It's to you. You're to be number one. Help us, Lord, to put our faith in you and to live for you. Bring forward those now that need to make such decisions public in Christ's name. Amen.